Once upon a time, in the not-so-distant past of the 1970s, there was a fateful flight. Eastern Airlines Flight 401, destined for Miami. The plane, filled with hopeful hearts and dreams of sunny shores, set its course under the watchful eye of seasoned pilots. But fate, it seems, had a twisted plan in store. As the aircraft descended towards Miami, a landing gear malfunction unfolded, seemingly minor but enough to divert the crew's attention. And before anyone knew it, disaster struck, and the plane plunged into the unforgiving Everglades below. But that wasn't the end of the story. Oh no, it was just the beginning. In the aftermath of the crash, whispers began to circulate among airline folks and passengers alike, tales that would send shivers down your spine. They spoke of strange encounters, inexplicable apparitions that defied all reason. Now picture this, a flight attendant looking over her shoulder only to lock eyes with the ghostly figure of Captain Loft, the valiant pilot who fought till the end. Crew members, seasoned and skeptical, suddenly felt a gentle touch on their shoulders, or heard a faint voice calling their name from thin air. What was this spectral dance unfolding in the skies? Skeptics turned to believers, for the encounters were far too many to dismiss as mere coincidence. The legend of Flight 401's ghostly passengers began to soar, etching itself into the hearts and memories of all who heard it. So fasten your seatbelts. We're about to unravel the mysterious accounts of the ghosts of Flight 401. From the heartache of tragedy to the ethereal mysteries of the afterlife, this is a story that'll make you question what lies beyond the skies we know. But that's not all. As we dive deeper into the stories, we'll discover more than just Flight 401's presence. There's a web of unexplained events that connect the past to the present. More crashes, more apparitions, and more questions that demand answers. And so let's begin, for the mysterious threads of these tales will lead us to a realm where the past and the present collide, and where the line between the living and the departed blurs. Prepare to be spellbound by the stories we uncover, the mysteries we unravel, and the chilling encounters we recount. This is more than a tale of ghosts and hauntings. It's a journey into the uncharted territories of the human spirit and the profound connections that defy our understanding. So let's step into the unknown where the echoes of the past merge with the enigma of the present and where the truth of what lies beyond our sight beckons to be revealed. Welcome to the captivating world of When Walls Can Talk, where stories from the shadows become the tapestry of our understanding. Throughout the ages, man has repeated the same earnest saying, more of a question really, or perhaps even a plea, if these walls could talk. But what if they do, and always have? Perhaps their stories, memories, and messages are all around us, if only we would take the moment to listen. On this podcast, we reinvestigate legends and tales of the past and allow the echoes of their lessons to live on once again, informing us, educating us, and sharing new and unique insight into the inner workings of the paranormal and spiritual world. Will you dare to listen? This is When Walls Can Talk, the podcast. Just before midnight, December 29th, 1972. It was a standard evening flight from JFK to Miami. The sun had set and the cabin lights of Eastern Airlines Flight 401 flickered to life, casting a warm glow over the passengers settling into their seats. The atmosphere inside the aircraft was serene, 
with a mixture of excitement and relaxation hanging in the air. Some passengers chatted quietly with their neighbors while others leaned back, their eyes heavy with drowsiness, ready to drift off to sleep. The flight attendants moved gracefully through the aisles, offering friendly smiles and attending to the needs of their travelers. The hum of the plane's engines provided a soothing backdrop, almost like a lullaby as the aircraft sliced through the night sky. Vacationers were headed to the sunny shores of Miami, eager to escape the winter chill and embrace the warmth of the beach. Captain Robert Loft, an experienced pilot, commanded the flight with ease, his co-pilot and the rest of the crew working in harmony to ensure a smooth journey. The cockpit was filled with soft, calming light, illuminating the array of dials and instruments that guided the aircraft through the darkness. As the flight continued, the atmosphere remained tranquil, and the passengers started to succumb to the weariness of the day's travels. The gentle hum of conversation gradually faded, replaced by the soft sound of breathing and the occasional rustle of a magazine being set aside. Outside the plane's windows, the world was cloaked in darkness, with only the twinkling stars and the distant lights of towns far below breaking the black expanse. The vastness of the sky seemed to stretch on infinitely, and for a fleeting moment, the passengers felt like they were suspended in time and space. The aircraft that soared through the night skies on that fateful evening was not just any plane. It was Eastern Airlines' brand new Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. Passengers marveled at the modern airplane before them, their eyes widening with admiration as they stepped on board. The TriStar was a true beauty, boasting cutting-edge technology and luxurious amenities that set it apart from any other plane of its time. The cabin exuded an air of sophistication and elegance, with plush, comfortable seats that cradled passengers like first-class travelers. The large windows allowed natural light to spill in during the day, and now, as night fell, they offered glimpses of the starlit sky, captivating those who stole glances outside. Unknown to everyone on board, this routine flight would soon take an unexpected turn, forever intertwining their story with the history of aviation. The plane continued on its path, seemingly like any other flight, but the night held secrets that would soon unravel, capturing the hearts and minds of those who would hear the chilling tale of Eastern Airlines Flight 401. On that fateful evening, the captain at the helm of Flight 401 was the esteemed and experienced Captain Robert Albin Bob Loft, a true veteran in the skies. At 55 years old, Captain Loft boasted an impressive track record, ranking 50th in seniority among Eastern Airlines' esteemed pilots. With an astounding 32 years of service under his belt, he had accumulated a staggering 29,700 flight hours throughout his illustrious flying career. A true master of his craft, he had logged 280 hours specifically on the magnificent L-1011 aircraft. Accompanying Bob Loft were his capable and trusted co-pilots. First Officer Albert John Burt Stockstill, aged 39, brought his own wealth of flying experience to the table, with a total of 5,800 flight hours under his wings. Of those, 306 were dedicated to honing his skills on the L-1011. Alongside him was flight engineer Don Lewis Don Repo, aged 51, a seasoned aviator with an impressive 15,700 hours of flying experience to his name, making him a valuable asset to the flight team that night. Adding a unique dimension to this journey was the presence of technical officer Angelo Donadeo, aged 47. Though he was an employee of the company, this particular flight marked a return to Miami from an assignment in New York. Officially classified as off-duty, non-revenue passenger, Angelo Donadeo brought with him an impressive perspective, adding additional purpose to the flight. With a gentle hum of the flight's engines, Captain Robert Loft's reassuring voice echoed through the cabin, signaling the beginning of the final descent into the vibrant city of Miami. The atmosphere inside the aircraft was a mix of excitement and relaxation as passengers prepared to embark on their warm, sun-kissed adventures. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
Captain Loft's voice emanated from the overhead speakers. This is your captain speaking. We hope you've enjoyed the flight so far aboard our beautiful Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. As we make our approach into Miami International Airport, the weather down below is just as welcoming as ever, with clear skies and a balmy temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit. The mention of Miami's delightful weather elicited contented smiles and subtle nods among the passengers. Many had escaped the chill of northern winters to bask in the sunshine of this tropical paradise. It was a moment they had eagerly awaited, the anticipation palpable. Captain Loft continued, his voice exuding the calm and confidence of a seasoned aviator. We'd like to take a moment to extend our gratitude for choosing Eastern Airlines for your journey today. We know you have options when it comes to flying, and we're honored to have been your carrier of choice. The flight attendants, stationed gracefully throughout the cabin, exchanged warm glances with passengers. Their expressions mirrored the sentiments of the captain's words, acknowledging the privilege of serving their valued guests aboard this extraordinary aircraft. As the clock struck 11.30, the airplane commenced its descent towards the bustling Miami International Airport. The atmosphere inside the cockpit was calm and focused, with Captain Loft and First Officer Stockstill meticulously going through the landing procedures. The aircraft's sleek metal frame hummed contentedly, seemingly at ease with the familiar motions. But just as the landing gear started its descent, a keen-eyed First Officer Stockstill noticed something amiss. His eyes narrowed on the landing gear indicator, a simple green light that should have confirmed the nose gear was securely locked in the down position. Yet to his dismay, the telltale glow remained conspicuously absent. First, Officer Stockstill's heart skipped a beat, and a sense of urgency swept over him. He quickly relayed his observation to Captain Loft, their voices hushed but filled with concern. The seasoned pilots exchanged glances, a shared understanding passing between them. This was no time for panic. It was a moment for precise action and swift decision-making. The cockpit's atmosphere shifted as they sprang into action, consulting their training and years of experience. The once serene space now buzzed with focused energy as they worked together to address the situation. With steady hands and unwavering determination, they initiated the necessary checks to confirm the status of the landing gear. Outside the cockpit, the night air held its breath, seemingly waiting alongside the passengers for the outcome of this unexpected challenge. The twinkling lights of Miami drew nearer, but the impending landing now hung in an uncertain balance. As the pilots poured over the controls, the cabin crew, unbeknownst to the passengers, communicated through discreet glances, sensing that something unusual was unfolding at the front of the plane. Despite the outward composure they maintained, their hearts beat in rhythm with the pilots as the gravity of the situation settled upon them all. For Captain Loft and First Officer Stockstill, every second felt like an eternity, yet their training allowed them to maintain a steadfast composure. With their shared expertise, they skillfully navigated the intricate web of aircraft systems, searching for any anomaly that could explain the mysterious absence of that reassuring green light. Captain Loft, his experienced hands firmly on the radio, communicated with the tower, their voices calm but resolute. They decided to discontinue the approach to their airport, opting to enter into a holding pattern over the vast expanse of the Everglades. The flight controller's clearance allowed them to climb to 2,000 feet, a temporary respite amidst the growing tension. I'm in tower during Eastern 401, just turned on final. Eastern 401 heavy, continue approach to 9 left. Let's continue approach, Roger. Now I'm going to try it down one more time. You want me to test the lights or not? Yeah, check it. Uh, Doug, it could be the light. Could you jiggle the light? You want me to fly, Doug? What frequency did he want us on? Uh, 28.6. I'll talk to him. All right, approach control Eastern 401. We're right over the airport here and climbing to 2,000 feet. In fact, we've just reached 2,000 feet, and we've got to get a green light on our nose gear. Eastern 401, Roger. Turn left, heading 360. Maintain 2,000. Vectors to 9 left final. We got pressure? Yes, sir, all systems. Put the damn thing on autopilot. All right. 
With the light assembly removed and 2nd Officer Repo dispatched to the avionics bay below, the crew sought visual confirmation of the landing gear's position. Hope mingled with apprehension as they awaited Repo's verdict. Hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel's down. Okay. To hell with this. Go down and see if that red line is lined up down there. Don't screw around with that 20 cent piece of light equipment. Eastern 401, I'll go out west just a little further if we can here and see if we can get this light to come on. All right. It's always something. We could have made schedule. Well, we can tell if the damn gear is down by uh, looking down at the indices. Fifty seconds passed, marked by the gentle hum of the engines and the soft glow of instruments in the dimly lit cockpit. Put her on autopilot, Captain Loft instructed, handing over the controls to First Officer Stockstill. The aircraft complied, and for the next 80 seconds it sailed through the night sky with the grace of a soaring eagle. But then, an unexpected ripple disturbed the tranquility. It's gotta be a faulty light. Looks like this damn thing just won't come out. All right, just leave it there. Eastern 401, how are things coming along out there? The L-1011 dipped, descending a hundred feet before leveling off once more. A curious blip in an otherwise seamless journey, the pilots might have shrugged it off as a momentary hiccup, a fleeting deviation in the vastness of the skies. For two more minutes, the aircraft held its course, seeming to regain its composure, yet an eerie twist lay in wait, a descent so gradual, so subtle, that it eluded even the keen senses of the experienced crew. In the next 70 seconds, the airplane shed another 250 feet of its hard-earned altitude, inching closer to a precipice they could not foresee. In the depths of the cockpit, the altitude-warning sea chord chime nestled beneath the engineer's workstation rang out like a somber cry. But fate had a cruel twist. The engineer, Repo, had ventured far below at that precise moment, and the chime's warning initially remained unheard, concealed within the labyrinth of the aircraft's interior. As another 50 seconds drifted by, the aircraft found itself precariously positioned, hanging at mere half of its assigned altitude. The dark expanse of the Everglades below was oblivious to the unfolding drama above, a tale of puzzlement, urgency, and an impending tragedy. Within the cockpit, confusion began to take root. Stockstill, at the controls, tried to decipher the enigma that had now befallen him. Hey, we did some of the altitude here. What? Uh, we're still at 2,000, right? Hey, what's happening here? Captain Loft, his eyes scanning the instruments, sought an answer to the riddle that unfolded before them. What's happening here? He questioned, the weight of the situation pressing upon him. We're supposed to be at 2,000 feet, but this says 900. Mercy, a seasoned flight attendant with two decades of experience, vividly recounted the night that would haunt her memories. As the Tri-Star descended towards Miami, she glanced out the window and immediately sensed something was amiss. Miami was not where it should be. The plane had clearly overflown its destination. In the midst of her concern, the aircraft jolted violently with an intense vibration that shook the entire cabin. Panic and confusion swept over the passengers as they clung to their seats, seeking answers for this sudden chaos. The captain was desperately trying to pull the nose upwards, attempting to regain control of the situation. In that moment, a strange phenomenon unfolded before Mercy's eyes. The cabin lights flickered erratically, as if an invisible wave swept through the aircraft from front to back, and then, all at once, Darkness engulfed the interior, plunging them into an eerie silence. Suddenly, the nightmarish ordeal took a horrifying turn. The plane began to twist and turn in a macabre dance, as if possessed by an unseen force. It spun a complete 360 degrees, a terrifying spectacle that defied comprehension. The world inside the aircraft became a blur of chaos and destruction, as Mercy clung to her last shreds of hope. And in those fleeting seconds, when questions lingered unanswered and the night held its breath, fate dealt its final hand. On the radio, the tower simply heard a click, a series of beeps from the airplane's radio transmission, the ghostly whispers of impending doom. The seconds that followed witnessed the unimaginable, 
the jetliner's impact, the sound of metal meeting earth, and the heart-wrenching finality of Flight 401. At a speed of 227 miles per hour, the aircraft met its fate, hurtling towards the earth with eerie determination. Mid-turn, it seemed as though the plane's path had been diverted by an unseen hand, leading it towards an unforeseen encounter with the unforgiving earth below. The dance of tragedy commenced. The left wingtip struck the surface first, followed by the left engine and the left landing gear etching three sorrowful trails through the lush sawgrass. Each trail, five feet wide and stretching over a hundred feet in length, bore witness to the aircraft's last moments. As the main part of the fuselage collided with the earth, it continued its macabre dance, slashing through the grass and water. The metal frame, once a symbol of human ingenuity and soaring aspirations, now lay broken and scattered mirroring the scattered hopes of those who embarked on this ill-fated journey. In the midst of the desolate Everglades, an eerie silence settled, the night concealing the true extent of the devastation. A tragedy that would forever echo in the annals of aviation history, a tale of darkness and loss known as Flight 401. The location of the tragedy lay hidden in the darkness, west-northwest of Miami, veiled in the obscurity of the night. The distance of 18.7 miles from the end of runway 9L marked the chilling final destination of Flight 401. A journey that should have ended with warm welcomes and joyful reunions. In the aftermath of the heart-wrenching collision, the toll of human lives lost was revealed with somber clarity. A total of 101 souls had tragically perished. Among them were three of the four cockpit crew members, their dreams of the skies forever grounded. Two of the ten dedicated flight attendants, who once graced the aisles with warmth and care, had left this earthly realm. As for the passengers, a grim fate awaited many of them. Out of the 163 hopeful souls on board, 96 had succumbed to the cruel hands of destiny leaving behind heartbroken families and shattered dreams. In the aftermath of the devastating crash of Flight 401, one painful truth emerged. This catastrophic event was entirely avoidable, a tragedy born from the confluence of seemingly mundane circumstances. The aircraft was a marvel of modern engineering, and the landing gear, crucial for a safe descent, was indeed operational. Yet it was the failure of a mere light bulb, a tiny and seemingly insignificant component that initiated the chain of events leading to the untimely demise of 101 innocent souls. In the aftermath of the devastating crash, the scene was one of heart-wrenching destruction. The once magnificent TriStar now lay broken and scattered across the soft earth. As the aircraft made its tragic descent, the port outer wing structure hit the ground first, setting off a series of catastrophic events. With the force of the impact, the wingtip gouged the surface, leaving only fragments of metal as evidence of its initial contact. The aircraft's undercarriage followed, cutting three massive swaths through the mud and sawgrass before two of its legs were tragically sheared off. The disintegration of the plane continued, with wreckage scattered over an area of 1,600 feet and 330 feet wide stretching southwestward. The plane had hit the ground at 227 miles per hour, barrel rolled three times before finally hitting a levee, which brought the incredible speed to a sudden halt. The devastation painted a grim picture, a tragic tale told by the debris scattered along the wreckage trail. Fragments from the number one engine in the port wing lay interspersed with parts from the underfloor galley, the cargo compartments, and the once bustling cabin interior. Passenger seats, once filled with hopeful travelers, were now strewn haphazardly amidst the debris. About 820 feet along the wreckage trail, the outer section of the starboard wing tore off, leaving a profound crater in the marshy ground. 
The breakup of the fuselage intensified from this point onwards, as metal fragments, cabin fittings, and passenger belongings were flung in all directions. Amidst the desolation, an incongruous sight caught the eye. A large, undamaged rubber dinghy, fully inflated and ready for use. It stood as a stark reminder of the emergency preparations that had been made, an ironic juxtaposition amidst the devastation. The once cohesive structure of the aircraft now lay fragmented, the three major sections of the fuselage torn apart. The tail assembly, surprisingly one of the most intact sections, lay further forward than the others. It appeared that the number two engine located on the tail had continued to deliver thrust during the harrowing moments of the aircraft's breakup, affecting its final resting position. Amidst the wreckage and darkness that enveloped the crash site, the remaining flight attendants wasted no time in mustering their courage and resilience. Their training kicked in, and despite the harrowing conditions, they became beacons of hope for those who were still breathing amidst the debris. With flashlights in hand, they embarked on a desperate hunt for any survivors they could find. The swampy terrain and darkness posed formidable challenges, making the task of locating survivors a daunting one. But their determination drove them forward, knowing that every minute counted in a race against time. Among the wreckage, they discovered a miracle. A precious 11-month-old baby, alone and frightened, both of whose parents had tragically not survived the impact. With tender care, they cradled the infant, offering comfort and reassurance amidst the chaos. They became the guardians of this innocent life, a reminder that even in the darkest moments, there was a glimmer of hope to hold on to. The flight attendants knew that the presence of fuel in the water added an extra layer of danger. They shouted warnings, calling out to anyone who could hear, urging them not to light a match for fear of igniting a catastrophic fire amidst the wreckage. Their voices carried across the swamp, a haunting chorus of caution intended to protect those who were still fighting to stay alive. Yet, they realized that the darkness was a formidable foe, making it nearly impossible for survivors to find their way through the tangled mess of debris and sawgrass. The flight attendants, quick thinking and resourceful, decided to transform their voices into a lifeline. In the darkness, they began to sing Christmas carols, their melodic voices cutting through the night like a guiding star. Their impromptu choir became a beacon of hope for anyone able to move through the wreckage. Those who could hear the sounds of their voices felt a surge of strength and determination, knowing that rescuers were out there, tirelessly searching for survivors. Overhead, the haunting sounds of circling helicopters filled the air. The desperate pilots were eager to find a safe landing spot amidst the dense debris, yet the wreckage was scattered far and wide, and the swamp's unforgiving nature made it challenging to find a clear and stable spot for the helicopter to touch down. Undeterred, the flight attendants kept singing, their voices carrying a message of hope to anyone who could hear. They were not just searching for survivors, they were lighting a path towards rescue. Many survivors who managed to escape the disintegrating aircraft found themselves unconscious in the swamp's treacherous embrace. The impact of the crash and the disorientation that followed left them helpless and unaware of the looming danger. The swamp water, tainted with jet fuel, became a silent adversary, claiming more lives to drowning even as rescue efforts were underway. Despite the heroic attempts to locate survivors, the darkness and chaos of the crash site made it challenging to identify those who were unconscious and struggling in the water. In the midst of the darkness that enveloped the crash site, a tale of heroism and resilience emerged, one that would forever be etched in the memories of those who were there to witness it. Robert Marquis and Ray Dickinson, out on a night of frog gigging, suddenly found themselves thrust into a harrowing scene as they witnessed the TriStar's catastrophic descent. Without a moment's hesitation, they rushed to the aid of the survivors. Marquis, despite sustaining burns to his face, arms, and legs from spilled jet fuel, pressed on. He bravely shuttled people in and out of the crash site throughout the night and into the next day. His unwavering commitment to saving lives earned him the Humanitarian Award from the National Air Disaster Alliance Foundation and the esteemed Alumatech Airboat Hero Award 
from the American Airboat Search and Rescue Association, an accolade well deserved for his selfless actions. From the depths of the wreckage and chaos, 75 souls emerged as survivors. Their will to live and the spirit of solidarity among them was awe-inspiring. The flight attendants, despite their own injuries, went above and beyond to aid their fellow survivors. Tragically, the cockpit crew bore the brunt of the impact, and only flight engineer Don Repo survived the initial crash. Captain Robert Bob Loft lost his life in the wreckage of the flight deck, and First Officer Albert John Burt Stockstill was killed on impact. Technical Officer Angelo Donadeo, who was with Repo in the nose electronics bay at the moment of impact, managed to survive the crash, but succumbed to his injuries later. Amidst the lost and devastation, the swamp's unique terrain played an unexpected role in the survival of some passengers. The Everglades, though it absorbed much of the energy from the crash, presented its own challenges. The mud likely blocked wounds, preventing some from bleeding to death. However, it also led to infections caused by swamp organisms with the potential for gas gangrene. Medical teams faced the arduous task of treating these injuries, resorting to hyperbaric chambers in their efforts to heal the survivors. The National Transportation Safety Board delved deep into the investigation, seeking answers to the tragic events that unfolded on Flight 401. The culprit was soon revealed, an innocent mistake that set off a chain of events leading to devastation. It all began with a seemingly routine switch between autopilot modes. Inadvertently, the autopilot was switched from altitude hold to control wheel steering mode. In this mode, the aircraft's pitch altitude is maintained until the control wheel is moved again. The switch occurred when Captain Loft, turning to speak to the flight engineer seated behind him, accidentally leaned against the yoke, applying slight forward pressure. This initiated a slow descent, and the CWS system took control unbeknownst to the crew. An unsettling discovery emerged during the investigation. The force required to switch to CWS mode was different between the A and B channels. A switch to CWS in Channel A may not have occurred in Channel B, depriving the first officer of any indication that the mode had changed. As a result, the first officer remained unaware of the aircraft's descent, as Channel A primarily provides data to the captain's instruments. A crucial altitude alert sounded, designed to warn pilots of any deviation from the scheduled altitude. However, amidst the crew's distraction with the nose gear light and the flight engineer not being in his seat at the time, the warning went unnoticed. The darkness of the night and the absence of ground lights over the Everglades concealed any visual clues that the TriStar had gradually descended. In the midst of the investigation, another discovery was made. Captain Loft had an undetected brain tumor that affected his vision. Nevertheless, the transportation board concluded that the tumor did not play a role in the accident, focusing instead on the unfortunate sequence of events that unfolded in the cockpit. The final board report left no room for speculation. It was pilot error that led to the tragic crash of Flight 401. The report pointed out that the flight crew's failure to monitor the flight instruments during the final crucial moments was the primary cause of the disaster. They had missed the unexpected descent, and as a result, the aircraft collided with the ground. The crew's attention had been diverted by a malfunction of the nose landing gear position indicating system. Fixated on this issue, they inadvertently neglected the flight instruments, ultimately leading to the fateful descent going unnoticed until it was too late. The consequences were devastating, claiming the lives of 101 souls. This horrific accident spurred the aviation industry into action. Airlines recognized the pressing need for enhanced training to equip their pilots with better problem-solving skills and efficient decision-making capabilities in the cockpit. The result was the implementation of crew resource management training. This training aims to foster effective teamwork and communication among crew members, minimizing distractions, and fostering a more focused approach to critical situations. 
The lessons learned from the tragedy of Flight 401 have had a lasting impact on aviation safety. Airlines continue to prioritize crew training and implement technological advancements to prevent similar errors from occurring in the future. While the memories of that fateful night remain etched in history, the pursuit of safer skies drives the industry forward, ensuring that the lives lost in this heartbreaking accident were not in vain. Indeed, the crash of Flight 401 serves as a haunting and tragic backdrop to the story we are delving into today, the eerie tales of the ghosts of Flight 401. The events surrounding the crash were filled with human error, distraction, and missed warnings, leading to a devastating loss of lives. However, it is the aftermath of this disaster that leaves us with a lingering sense of the supernatural. In the wake of the accident, some peculiar occurrences began to emerge, captivating the imagination of those involved and sparking rumors amongst aviation professionals. Reports of ghostly apparitions and unexplained phenomena soon circulated. These mysterious events reached far beyond the boundaries of the aircraft's wreckage and the Florida Everglades. Crew members, mechanics, and even passengers on other flights claimed to have encountered the spirits of Captain Loft, First Officer Stockstill, and Flight Engineer Repo, each appearing to them in a hazy, ghostly form. The sightings were not confined to one location or a singular instance. They became a reoccurrent theme, leading many to believe that the spirits of the lost crew members were inexplicably bound to the very aircraft that had met its tragic end. Tales of unexplained noises, inexplicable sensations, and even full-fledged conversations with these spectral figures further added to the enigma surrounding Flight 401. Stranger still were the reports of malfunctioning aircraft where some of the parts from the ill-fated TriStar were installed. Inexplicable anomalies, electrical glitches, and strange occurrences plagued these planes, raising unsettling questions about the souls who had perished on that ill-fated flight. As we explore the ghosts of Flight 401, we find ourselves navigating a realm where the lines between reality and the supernatural are blurred. While some skeptics might dismiss these accounts as mere coincidences or an overactive imagination, the stories persist, leaving a haunting imprint on the minds of those who encountered them. Whether you believe in the paranormal or not, the tale of the ghosts of Flight 401 invites us to peer into the unknown and consider the mysteries that lie beyond the tangible world. From the tragic origins of the flight's crash to the unexplained encounters that followed, this is a story that tugs at the boundaries of our understanding and leaves us questioning the very fabric of our reality. In the immediate aftermath of the Flight 401 crash, something inexplicable and otherworldly seemed to take hold of the crash site and its surroundings. Ghostly apparitions of the crew members, Captain Loft, First Officer Stockstill and Flight Engineer Repo, were said to be seen wandering near the wreckage. Their forms appeared hazy and ethereal, leaving those who witnessed them both stunned and unsettled. Orbs of light and unexplained sounds were also reported in the area surrounding the crash site. Witnesses claimed to have seen mysterious orbs of light hovering in the swampy terrain, while others heard disembodied voices or inexplicable noises echoing through the darkness. These encounters were not isolated incidents. They continued to occur in the days and weeks following the crash. The combination of ghostly sightings and inexplicable occurrences gave rise to a sense of unease and a growing belief that something supernatural was at play. As news of these strange events spread, the legend of the ghosts of Flight 401 began to take shape. The crash site became a focal point for paranormal enthusiasts and those curious about the unexplained, drawing people from all walks of life who sought to witness or understand these phenomena. Among the strange occurrences following the tragic crash, one most common is the sighting of a woman screaming in the vicinity of the wreckage. This sighting was not limited to a single witness. Multiple people, including rescue workers and investigators, claimed to have encountered the distraught figure. According to some witnesses, 
The woman appeared to be dressed in airline attire, resembling a flight attendant or crew member. She was seen wandering amidst the wreckage, her face contorted with agony and letting out haunting screams that echoed through the desolate swamp. Strangely, when rescue workers approached the woman to offer assistance, she would simply vanish into thin air, leaving them bewildered and searching for answers. Some reported a feeling of intense coldness in her presence, while others sensed an overwhelming sadness that lingered in the air. In the years that followed the tragic Flight 401 crash, Eastern Airlines took a cautious stance regarding the eerie events that unfolded on their subsequent flights. The company issued a directive to its employees, emphasizing discretion and urging them not to openly discuss the strange occurrences related to Flight 401. While the official reason for this policy was not publicly disclosed, the crew members couldn't help but feel a lingering sense of unease. As time passed, rumors began to surface among flight attendants and crew members about ghostly encounters on their planes. Approximately two years after the crash, stories quietly circulated about crew members witnessing apparitions of those who had perished in the tragedy. These ghostly figures were said to manifest on board the plane during flights, catching glimpses of them as they moved through the cabin, seemingly trapped in an eternal loop of their final moments. These sightings were often described as surreal and unsettling. The flight attendants who experienced these encounters spoke of seeing figures dressed in the airline's old uniforms, their appearance as vivid as if they were still living passengers. The encounters varied, and not all crew members experienced them, but those who did were profoundly affected by the inexplicable phenomena. Some of the flight attendants who had survived the crash found themselves questioning their own perceptions, wondering if the stress and trauma from the accident were playing tricks on their minds. However, as more stories emerged from different crew members and flight routes, it became increasingly difficult to dismiss these accounts as mere coincidence or imagination. The consistent and reoccurring nature of the ghostly encounters added weight to the claims, leaving even more unsettled and searching for answers. Despite Eastern Airlines' efforts to keep such stories hushed, word continued to spread discreetly among the airline's employees. These haunting experiences became part of a whispered lore shared among the flight attendants, serving as a testament to the profound impact that Flight 401 had had on those who survived and continued to work for the company. The Ghosts of Flight 401 is a captivating book that delves into all of the eerie and unexplained events that followed the tragic crash. Written by John G. Fuller and published in 1976, the book meticulously encounters the haunting tales of ghostly encounters reported by Eastern Airlines employees and passengers after the accident. Drawing from extensive interviews and research, Fuller chronicles the stories of crew members who claim to have witnessed apparitions of the deceased Flight 401 passengers aboard subsequent flights. These encounters were not limited to just one or two isolated incidents, but were reportedly experienced by various flight attendants and even some passengers. What made these stories particularly haunting was the vividness and detail with which the crew members described the apparitions. The encounters were not fleeting glimpses or vague shapes. The presence of the ghosts felt so tangible that it left many shaken and perplexed. Cherie Wabash, a seasoned flight attendant with 40 years of experience, had seen her fair share of strange occurrences throughout her career. But nothing could have prepared her for the chilling encounter that left her scared half to death. It was just another routine flight, and Cherie was going about her usual tasks with ease. As she stowed her own suitcase beneath the flight attendant station, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Suddenly, her attention was drawn to a peculiar sight. A faint ring of smoke slowly escaped from beneath the floor, rising before her very eyes. But this was no ordinary smoke. It began to take shape, forming the unmistakable silhouette of a man. Her heart pounded in her chest as she watched in disbelief. Before she could react, the apparition solidified into the form of a man, seemingly standing right before her. She recognized the figure before her. It was Don, the engineer who tragically lost his life in the Flight 401 crash. 
Time seemed to stand still as Cherie stared at the apparition, her mind racing to make sense of what she was witnessing. Dawn's energy seemed to permeate the air around her, and she felt an inexplicable connection to him. It was as if he was reaching out to her from the beyond, trying to communicate something of great importance. Intuitively, Cherie sensed that Dawn's appearance was not without purpose. She felt that he wouldn't have manifested before her unless something was terribly wrong. It was as if he had a message to convey, but the words were lost in the ethereal realm between the living and the departed. The encounter left Cherie shaken to her core. She couldn't ignore the weight of what she had witnessed, a ghostly manifestation of a former colleague and friend, appearing in a swirl of smoke. She knew deep down that this was no mere coincidence or figment of her imagination. To her surprise, Cherie discovered that she was not alone in her eerie experience. Many of her fellow flight attendants had encountered similar phenomena, each describing apparitions and strange occurrences on board the planes. But after the initial shock and astonishment, a strange silence enveloped the topic, as if the airline had forbidden any further discussion of the paranormal encounters. Despite the silence, she couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story, a mystery that needed to be unraveled. The apparition of Dawn remained etched in her memory, and she felt a sense of responsibility to acknowledge and understand what had transpired. In the years that followed, Cherie remained haunted by the encounter, forever changed by her brush with the supernatural. The memory of Dawn's apparition lingered, a reminder of the unexplicable forces that seemed to inhabit the plains, particularly those who had received salvage parts from the ill-fated Flight 401. Now, it makes sense, of course, that the crash site would be haunted, but why on earth would both passengers and crew be experiencing such vivid paranormal experiences while in flight, thousands of feet above the ground? The question lingers in the midst of all those intrigued by the mysterious events surrounding Eastern Airlines Flight 401. The notion of paranormal encounters within the confines of an airplane, high above the Earth's surface, seems incomprehensible. Yet the accounts of both passengers and crew witnessing ghostly apparitions during subsequent flights are undeniable and inexplicable. As the baffling reports of supernatural experiences continued to surface, investigators started to notice a peculiar pattern that defied all logical explanations. It quickly became apparent that the majority of these uncanny incidents occurred on planes that had received non-structural salvage parts rescued from the wreckage of Flight 401. The salvaged parts, saved from the ill-fated flight, had been incorporated into other aircraft without any immediate thought given to their origin. Yet, as these components found their way onto various planes, so too did the ghostly encounters. Passengers and crew members began recounting eerie tales of apparitions and inexplicable phenomena, all while on board planes that carried a piece of the tragic Flight 401 within them. One account came from a seasoned flight attendant, Emily Johnson, who had been working on an airplane that had undergone extensive maintenance, including the installation of salvage parts from Flight 401. As the plane soared through the sky, she noticed a flickering light in the corner of her eye. When she turned to investigate, she was met with the ghostly figure of a flight engineer clad in an Eastern Airlines uniform, staring at her with hollow eyes. Emily, frozen with fear, was unable to comprehend what she was witnessing. The apparition vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving her shaken and questioning her sanity. It wasn't just the flight attendants who experienced these strange encounters. Passengers, too, began sharing chilling stories of seeing shadowy figures wandering the aisles disembodied voices whispering in their ears, and unexplained cold spots. The common thread among all these flights was the presence of these salvage parts, sparking both curiosity and fear among those who learned about the connection. Rumors and speculations about the potential influence of the salvaged parts on these haunting experiences spread like wildfire. 
Some believed that the residual energy from the tragic crash had somehow imprinted itself onto the components, and this energy was now manifesting in the form of ghostly apparitions. Others entertained the idea that restless spirits of the deceased had found an unexpected vessel in the salvaged parts, allowing them to roam the skies once again. As more incidents were reported, airlines and aviation authorities were forced to confront the eerie phenomenon. But despite efforts to debunk or explain away the occurrences, the inexplicable encounters persisted, leaving many to wonder if there was more to this puzzle than met the eye. The already eerie situation surrounding the supernatural took a darker turn when airline employees started to notice a disturbing pattern in the on-plane logbooks. Whenever something unusual or paranormal was reported by passengers or crew members, the related logbook pages would mysteriously vanish, as if someone was trying to erase any evidence of the strange occurrences. Flight attendants, pilots, and maintenance crew members who were trained to meticulously document any incidents or anomalies that occurred during flights began noticing the disappearing pages with growing concern. It seemed as though any record of the unexplained was being deliberately concealed from official records. At first, some speculated that it might be a coincidence or a simple case of pages falling out or getting misplaced, but as the pattern persisted and more logbooks were affected, the employees couldn't ignore the uncanny circumstances any longer. Even sometimes the logbooks themselves would be completely replaced, appearing brand new raising suspicions that someone was intentionally tampering with the documentation. Rumors and whispers among the airline staff spread like wildfire, fueling suspicions that there was a deliberate cover-up. Some believed that the higher-ups in the airline industry were trying to suppress any information about the supernatural experiences to avoid public panic or damage their reputation. In the face of these peculiar incidents, employees who had witnessed the ghostly encounters felt torn between their duty to report the truth and the fear of potential repercussions by their employer. Many chose to remain silent, afraid that speaking out might jeopardize their careers or lead to ridicule from their peers. The revelation in later years of the consistent supernatural occurrences and the suspected link to the salvaged parts from Flight 401 sent shockwaves through the airline industry. Faced with mounting concerns and growing public interest in the paranormal records, the airlines decided to take action. In an effort to quell the unsettling experiences and avoid further speculation, orders were issued from headquarters to remove all the salvaged components from the planes. The task of removing them fell on the shoulders of the chief mechanics, who were well aware of the eerie reputation that surrounded these planes. With a sense of trepidation, the mechanics began the process of carefully and methodically replacing each salvage part with new components. These parts were then treated with utmost caution, almost as if they were fragile relics with an unknown power. Rumors circulated among the mechanics as they wondered about the possible connection between these parts and the inexplicable events that unfolded on the haunted flights. As the planes underwent these transformations, many employees couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and apprehension. On one hand, they hoped that removing the salvaged components would put an end to the ghostly encounters and restore a sense of normalcy to their flights. On the other hand, the secrecy surrounding the fate of the removed parts only added to the mystery. Once these parts were removed, the question of their whereabouts remained unanswered. Speculations abounded, ranging from them being disposed of or destroyed, to being stored away in some undisclosed location. In an intriguing turn of events, the story of the ghosts of Flight 401 found themselves at the center of an intriguing cinematic venture in 2022. The Shock Docs film, aptly titled Ghosts of Flight 401, brought together renowned psychic medium Cindy Keza and a team of investigators to delve into the world of the paranormal and the haunted legacy of the ill-fated flight. With cameras rolling and deep in alligator and python-infested swamp waters of the Everglades, Cindy Keza took on the formidable challenge of connecting with the spirits at the crash site. Her reputation as a gifted medium preceded her, and audiences around the world eagerly awaited the unraveling of the spectral mystery. In a spine-chilling revelation, 
The investigators of Ghosts of Flight 401 captured Class A EVPs that defied explanation and left no room for skepticism. Amidst the whispers and eerie sounds, the unmistakable voice of a spirit emerged, speaking with remarkable clarity and intelligence. The captured EVPs featured full sentences that reverberated with a haunting message. I'm the one who died in the plane crash, as well as two crystal clear words, need help. Cindy Kaza's psychic medium abilities had provided an unprecedented glimpse into the realm of the afterlife. The voices from beyond, captured in their purest form, shocked both the investigators and viewers. These Class A EVPs were not mere fragments or ambiguous sounds. They were crystal clear and conveyed a profound message. The presence of such distinct and articulate EVPs raised questions that reached far beyond the boundaries of the physical world. Could the spirits of the departed indeed be reaching out from another realm, attempting to communicate with the living? The profound nature of the messages suggested an intelligence beyond explanation, leaving the investigators grappling with the complexities of life, death, and the uncharted territories that lie beyond our comprehension. As Cindy Kaza stepped onto the haunted plane crash site, an overwhelming energy enveloped her. It was as if the restless spirits were eager to share their untold stories with her. But amidst the myriad of entities present, one stood out, calling out for attention with an intense urgency. Almost immediately, Cindy sensed the presence of a distraught woman, her spirit trapped in a perpetual state of despair and anguish. Cindy could feel the intensity of the woman's emotions, and as she connected with the spirit, the medium could see the haunting scene unfold before her eyes. In the moments following the crash, this tormented soul had met a sudden and tragic end. The impact had taken her life in an instant, leaving her disoriented and confused, desperately yearning for help. The woman's cries and heart-wrenching screams echoed through Cindy's mind, reaching out to the living in a desperate plea of assistance. She was searching frantically for her precious baby, lost amidst the chaos of the crash. Her maternal instincts, even in the afterlife, drove her to find her child and attempt to protect her at any cost. But in the moment of the crash, the living could not see or hear her, no matter how she implored or how loudly she cried out. She was trapped in a realm where the living and the departed could not directly interact. Her pain, her sorrow, and her pleas for help remained unheeded, and she was left to wander the area of the plane crash in an eternal state of torment. As Cindy delved deeper into the ethereal realm, her intuitive senses led her to another presence, one that exuded an overwhelming sense of responsibility and remorse. She felt it was a man, and she could feel the weight of guilt weighing heavily on his spirit. As she focused her psychic abilities, she immediately sensed a strong connection between this spirit and the tragic accident that had unfolded aboard the ill-fated flight. The man's energy resonated with the role of an engineer, and she instinctively knew that he had been an integral part of the flight crew. The engineer's spirit, believed to be Don Repo, seemed to be in a state of constant agitation, as if he were perpetually trapped in a cycle of remorse, desperately seeking to convey his apologies and sadness for his perceived role in the accident. He appeared to be tormented by the belief that his actions, or lack thereof, had contributed to the devastating outcome that had claimed so many lives. Cindy could sense that the spirit had been reaching out to others in various locations, trying to find solace and redemption for his perceived wrongs. People in different parts of the world had reported encounters with him, sharing stories of eerie interactions where they felt his presence and heard his desperate pleas for forgiveness. The investigation into the supernatural occurrences surrounding Flight 401 was an overwhelming and intense experience for the investigators. Every device used in the investigation seemed to be responding intelligently and continuously. The investigators were astounded by the level of intelligence displayed by the spirits they encountered. 
It was as if the departed souls were eager to convey their messages, sharing details about their past, their emotions, and their experiences in the afterlife. The constant flow of information left the investigators in awe and at times even unnerved as they struggled to process the enormity of what they were witnessing. As the investigation continued, Cindy was presented with a unique opportunity to perform psychometry on an actual artifact from the ill-fated plane. Psychometry is the art of placing one's hands on an object believed to be haunted and allowing your intuitive sense to pick up information without the use of your other senses. The item was presented to her, covered, hiding its identity, but she immediately sensed its significance as she touched it. As she laid her hands on the object, she was overwhelmed with impressions and visions flooding her mind. She knew immediately it was a window from the side of the cockpit, and in that moment, she saw herself looking out at the darkened night sky, realizing that they were no longer flying at the intended altitude of 2,000 feet. The experience was visceral and profound, as if she had been transported back to the haunting night when everything went wrong. Surrounding the window during the investigation were various devices, including melmeters and other detectors. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation, as if the very air had echoes of the past. As they initiated their inquiry, the responses were immediate and uncanny. It was as if someone from the cockpit on that fateful night was present in the room, eager to communicate with them. The meters and detectors registered anomalous readings, validating the presence of something beyond the ordinary. Using a digital recorder to capture any potential communication, they listened intently for any sign of the supernatural. And then, as they played back the recording, they were met with a crystal clear response. This is from the crash site. The artifact had become a conduit to the spirits of the past, offering glimpses into the lingering energies and unresolved mysteries surrounding the crash. For Cindy and her team, this encounter was nothing short of astounding. It solidified their belief that the spirits of Flight 401 were still present, seeking to communicate and share their stories from beyond the veil. The haunting legacy of the Flight 401 crash seemed to cast a chilling shadow over the very skies that once witnessed the tragic event. Twenty-four years later, in a cruel twist of fate, another plane met a catastrophic end less than a mile from the site of Flight 401's demise. This flight was Value Jet Flight 592. On May 11, 1996, Value Jet Flight 592 took off from Miami International Airport with 110 passengers and crew on board, bound for Atlanta, Georgia. However, shortly after takeoff, disaster struck. A fire erupted in the cargo hold, likely caused by the improper handling of hazardous materials. The pilots desperately tried to turn the aircraft back towards the airport, but the inferno's intensity overwhelmed them. The plane lost altitude rapidly, and within minutes, it also crashed into the dark and unforgiving swamp waters of the Everglades. As rescue teams rushed to the scene, they faced the haunting reality that history seemed to repeat itself, leaving them grappling with the chilling similarities. In the wake of the crash, investigators and witnesses couldn't help but draw connections between the two ill-fated flights, so close to where Flight 401 met its tragic end. It was as if the spirits of the past were reaching out, connecting the dots between the two disasters. As the wreckage was recovered and the victims mourned, the questions mounted. Was it mere coincidence that these two tragedies occurred in such close proximity, or was there something more at play? The haunting mysteries of aviation continue to unfold, reaching even further back in history. Decades before the tragic Flight 401 and the ill-fated ValueJet Flight 592, another disappearance shook the aviation world. U.S. Navy Flight 16 In the 1940s, Flight 16 embarked on what should have been a routine flight to the Bahamas and back. On that fateful day, the aircraft and its crew vanished without a trace, leaving behind a chilling mystery that has baffled investigators for generations. The circumstances surrounding the disappearance remain unsolved. How could a well-trained crew and a robust military aircraft simply vanish into thin air, leaving no clues or distress signals? 
The questions abound, but the answers were few. Interestingly, the Bermuda Triangle, infamous for its mysterious disappearances of ships and aircraft, is only a few miles away from the presumed route of Flight 16. The Bermuda Triangle's reputation as a paranormal hotbed has long captured the public's imagination. While we'll delve deeper into the Bermuda Triangle's legends and lore in more episodes, it's impossible to ignore the eerie proximity of this area to the vanished flight. Eager to unravel the mysterious threads linking these curious cases, Cindy and her investigative team set out on a journey to explore a place that might hold potential clues. The bizarre structure of Coral Castle. Built between 1923 and 1951 by Edward Leedskalnin, Coral Castle has long been a subject of fascination and speculation due to its unconventional construction. Massive blocks of coral rock, some weighing several tons, were meticulously arranged in intricate structures, defying conventional engineering practices of the time. The energy surrounding the site is palpable, a feeling of something unseen yet potent, guiding the construction of this architectural wonder. Edward Leedskalnin, the mastermind behind Coral Castle was known for his reclusive nature and was often seen working alone deep into the night. The how and why of his seemingly superhuman abilities to manipulate these colossal stones remains a captivating mystery. The team was drawn to the notion that an unspoken energy source might have fueled Leedskalnin's remarkable undertaking. Could it be that this energy, long forgotten or misunderstood, holds the key to the unexplained phenomena surrounding the crashed planes and their salvaged parts? Eager to discover any solutions, Cindy decided to venture into the heart of Coral Castle, seeking to forge a profound connection with the spirits of Flight 401 on this energetically charged ground. Surrounded by the ancient stones and immersed in the energy of the site, she opened herself to the unseen forces that might hold the key to unlocking the mysteries that bind these ethereal entities to this area. As the investigation at Coral Castle unfolded, the team was met with astonishing revelations. The messages they received from the spirit seemed to hint at an interconnected energy that binds all three crashes in the area. Flight 401, Value Jet Flight 592, and the mysterious disappearance of U.S. Navy Flight 16. The spirits, through Cindy's heightened mediumship, communicate with an urgency, as if they hold vital information that transcends the bounds of time. Their messages suggest that these tragedies were not mere accidents, but instead part of a larger, energetic tapestry that extends beyond the physical realm. The tale of Flight 401 is truly one that transcends the boundaries of time and space, weaving a tapestry of mystery, tragedy, and the supernatural. Through decades of investigation and first-hand accounts, we have delved into the haunting legacy of this ill-fated flight and the eerie apparitions that have emerged from its wreckage. From the night of the crash to the present day, the spirits of Flight 401 have left an imprint on the memories of the living. As we retraced the events of that fateful night, it became evident that Flight 401 was more than just an aviation accident. The presence of the departed crew and passengers in the wake of the crash has left haunting tales of spectral visions, eerie sounds, and unexplained phenomena that have captured the imagination of countless witnesses. These apparitions, encountered by flight attendants, passengers, and investigators, have left us pondering the nature of the afterlife and the lingering energies of intense emotional experiences. The spirit's cries for attention and understanding speak to a deep need for acknowledgement and closure. The repurposed flight parts from Flight 401 acted as conduits for this unexplained energy, transferring the emotional charge from the wreckage into other planes that carried them spreading the haunted legacy like a spectral contagion. The paranormal and supernatural capacity charged within these salvaged parts speaks to the profound effect that intense emotional experiences can have on the objects and environments that surround us. Through the investigations, we found that these phenomena extend beyond the confines of the aircraft, manifesting in various forms throughout the aviation industry. 
the logbook entries that mysteriously vanished or were replaced in the aftermath of any unusual events suggests a veil of secrecy surrounding these occurrences, leaving us to wonder if perhaps there were countless more that we will never know about, silenced in the vault of human memory. Our journey has led us to question the very fabric of reality, where the boundaries between the living and the departed blur, and the energy of tragic and emotionally charged situations permeates the walls and surfaces of our everyday lives. In our quest for answers, we have tapped into the essence of the human experience, the yearning for understanding, the search for meaning, and the desire to connect back with the land of the living when life is savagely snuffed out. As a community of When Walls Can Talk listeners, we delve into the unknown, standing witness to stories that resonate with the echoes of eternity. The spirits of Flight 401 are but a fraction of the countless mysteries that still await our exploration. Our curiosity, empathy, and open-mindedness forge a fierce path to delve deeper into the shadows. Together we have come to understand that the human experience is intrinsically tied to the ethereal realm a realm where the echoes of the past and the aspirations of the future intertwine. The spirits of Flight 401 beckon us to listen, to seek the truth, and to acknowledge the legacy they leave behind. Our community, bound by curiosity and shared wonder, stands bonded in the quest to unearth the mysteries that surround us. With each revelation, we inch closer to the essence of existence, discovering that the walls that talk to us are not mere structures of brick and mortar, but vessels that hold the echoes of forgotten lives and the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of the departed. Together we will continue to forge ahead, armed with the knowledge that every wall, every surface, and every space has a story to tell. Our journey into the realm of mysteries, ghosts, and unexplained phenomena in this corner of the world has only just scratched the surface. There are countless tales yet to be told, waiting to be unveiled and shared with our community of curious minds. Stay tuned, for there is much more to come in the captivating world of When Walls Can Talk. Our journey in this corner of the world has only just begun. This has been When Walls Can Talk, the podcast. My name is Jeremy Haig. I am your host, researcher, and executive producer. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thank you once again for joining us. You can find us on social media at When Walls Can Talk with underscores for spaces on Instagram and at WWCT, the podcast on Twitter. My email is jeremy at whenwallscantalktarot.com, and that is also our website, www.whenwallscantalktarot.com. If you want to engage more with our listenership, be sure to jump onto Facebook and join our Facebook group where we discuss new episodes, I share announcements for upcoming projects, etc. So definitely join in the conversation there. And as always, thank you so much, and I'll catch you.